begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. But as many as received him, to them he gave them the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Let's pause for a second so that we can utilize 1 John 1, 9 if we need to. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's, let's just pause for a second and then we'll go on with our study. Father, we thank you once again for allowing us to assemble together so that we can know you through your word. And I pray, Father, that if there's anything vying for our attention, uh, be it finances, relationships, uh, responsibilities, uh, Lord, whatever they may be, they, we know that they are important. I just pray that we would lay those aside so that we can concentrate on Thee, concentrate on Thy Word. We know that uh, it's through the regular intake of Your Word that allows us to um, make better decisions as we draw from the living Word, as we learn more about how You think by setting our minds on the things above so that on a daily basis we can make a decision from a position of strength rather than from human viewpoint. So help us, Father, to concentrate as we look into your word this afternoon. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, uh, January, we, it's been uh, just a little over a month now. We are still going through Acts. Remember, we are on, let, let me... If you have your Bibles, just by way of review, um, look at where we have been. Acts 1, 4. And we've been spending a little time here. And um, you see in verse 4 it says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. So what I have been doing is I have been explaining what this promise is. And this promise is related to a person. And this person is none other than the second person of the Trinity. Uh, actually, the third person of the Trinity, and that is who? God the Holy Spirit. So God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The focus in Acts 1-4 is this promise that originated, originated from the Father. He said, And being assembled together with them, verse 4, He commanded them. This is not optional. He did not want them to move one step. He did not want them to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise. The promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. So to me, it's very important for us to be clear on this promise because it greatly impacts all of us and it greatly impacts those beginning with Acts. Acts is a very interesting book. As I've said numerous times, Acts is what's called a transitional book. You get a lot of the various cults out there that will blur things from um, the book of Acts where you have to be baptized to be saved. And it's not that you have to be baptized to be saved. There's, there's a transition and there were protocol at the time and eventually that got phased out. And I don't even think uh, baptism is really for the church age anymore as per 1 Corinthians chapter 1 where Paul says, um, I remember... and." Um, uh, who is it? Stephanus. Let me just... Um, Crispus and Gaius, I believe. Um, but other than that, I don't recall who else I baptized. Um, and God, Jesus didn't send me to baptize. So this is Paul speaking to the Corinthians. So it's not wrong to be baptized. I just don't think it's the, 
normative anymore. It's not something that we are mandated to do. Uh, because if, if that's the case, Paul shouldn't have said what he said. He said, I, I don't remember who I last baptized. I know I baptized this family and that family, but other than that, it's been a, it's been a long time. So if it's mandatory, then Paul would have been saying, okay, you know, last person was last week, two weeks ago, and so on and so forth, but he doesn't say that. And I know he wasn't suffering from memory loss. He said, I don't remember, meaning it's been a long time. So um, it's very important, and that's why I'm taking the time to um, go over the promise. The promise makes a world of difference um, for you, for me, and how we conduct ministry and how we conduct our service for God. Uh, who are we supposed to operate under the influence of? God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is the one that influences, influences us. He empowers us. Walk by means of the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Galatians 5. So the Holy Spirit is now resident in each and every believer. And so we're not alone. We're not by ourselves. He empowers us. The Father created the plan. Jesus Christ executed the plan on the cross, ultimately. And the Holy Spirit now reveals the plan for each and every one of us and allows us and empowers us to um, obey the principles, obey the commandments as found in the Scripture. So take a look. We, there's a threefold convicting ministry. We looked at that uh, last year. Regeneration, that's a 50 cent word. What's another word for regeneration? The promise is now going to allow us to be born again. It's different from um, prior to Acts. People were believers in Christ. People looked forward to Christ. But no one was ever infused with Je the Holy Spirit. There may have been a few in the Old Testament to be able to carry out specific responsibilities. But it was not the normative like it is today. So that's huge. That means if you have an unbelieving friend who's struggling with sin, and if you get that person to acquiesce to Jesus Christ, now they have the power of God himself to be able to deal with those struggles. So we don't want to tell them to work on the struggles and come back and tell me if you're willing to believe in Jesus. We want them as soon as possible to respond to Jesus so that God himself can indwell the person, thereby allowing him to give spiritual strength and ability to be able to say no to sin. Sin can only be dealt with through God's help. Do you agree with that? So we can't ask someone to commit to change apart from God. How, how do, is that true? Do people really ask people to change before receiving God? And I would say yes. And a lot of uh, evangelisms, uh, witnessing programs, uh, part of the strategy is to get the person to surrender certain things first before God will actually save them. You got to clean up your life first, Freddie, before God will even accept you. God is a holy and just God. He does not want sin in your life. So at least, you know, go through the plan, go through the program. It's only six months. It's an error in doctrine. It's an error in doctrine. We are supposed to live holy lives, no doubt. We're supposed to live as unto the Lord, no doubt. But under the operating ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, we're supposed to walk by means of the Spirit, not in the energy of the flesh. That's the primary difference between the two. As I mentioned in our Thursday night class, if I give Mark a cup of coffee, um, but I'm doing it so that I can show you how good of a Christian I am, that short circuits anything, any, any reward from God, any, anything that would please God, because I'm drawing attention to who? I'm focusing on me. I want you to see me. I'm such a good Christian. I'm not saying it out loud, but my actions, I'm, I'm saying, Mark, oh, you look like you could use a cup of coffee. Oh, it's not me. It's the Lord. It's not me, but here. Right? It's kind of like that. V versus, Mark, could you use a cup of coffee? And I'm not even thinking about what you guys are thinking. I'm not even doing it. Yeah, it doesn't matter if you're here or not. The first scenario, I might not even give him coffee because there's no one watching. But the second scenario is, irregardless of people around or not, 
I'll give it to him because this is what I want to do. This is how I'm extending grace. This is how I'm walking by means of the Spirit. I'm making decisions based on the, the Word of God that's constantly transforming me to be more like Christ. And it doesn't matter if I'm getting approbation and pats on the back. It matters of whether or not I'm pleasing my Lord. And if I please my Lord, remember this? If my vertical relationship is intact, then horizontal relationships will be affected too in a positive way. I'm a better employer. I'm a better employee. I'm a better husband. I'm a better wife. I'm a better son. I'm a better daughter. I'm reliable. You can count on me. I'm trustworthy. Why? Because this vertical relationship here, which has been established through the Word of God, which allows me to see what God expects as someone who represents Him, will ultimately benefit anybody and everybody that's around me. And likewise, anybody that's around you should be benefited. It's called blessed by association. They should be blessed because of your presence. Because of who you honor, who you worship, who you love. I don't know of anywhere in scripture where by obeying him, it would be a problem for the person who's in front of you. You're only going to be a better person because God's word ultimately wants us to look like and result in, in uh, the person of Jesus Christ. He wants us to look like Christ. And if you and I would agree that Jesus Christ is the primary example, he's the best example, he's the perfect example, then that's a good thing. If he was here today, we should be following him, right? A Christian is someone who is Christ-like. We won't look like him as far as his physical appearance, but everything we say, think, and do should move along as he moves along, because actually he's in us. So if we're relying upon him, then everything we do should mirror the person of Christ under the empowering ministry of the Spirit. Okay? So regeneration is huge. Without regeneration, no one is born again. Without ge regeneration, no one can walk. No one can deal with the sin issues. But we have him, and that's called the promise. That's huge, Acts 1-4. So there's a threefold convicting ministry. There's regeneration. What's the indwelling? Exciting. Yeah, he's, he, he's residing in us. Isn't it nice when you have a good friend or a close friend who you can always reach out to and talk to, especially when you need someone to talk to? The Holy Spirit is resident in you. He indwells you. He never leaves you. Never leaves nor forsakes. And so if there's anybody here or online that goes through bouts of you know, loneliness, the way that you can reduce that is to get into the Word more and to recognize that God loves you so much that He's willing to abide in you as a believer in Christ. And to me, that's huge. Because we're, we're not talking about the person next to you. We're talking about the person who is the creator of the entire universe. He chose to reside in you. Your body is a temple. There has, it hasn't been a temple since AD 70. This is why I don't like to use the word sanctuary. Sanctuary isn't there in the front. The sanctuary is here. Do you agree that your body is the sanctuary of the Holy Spirit? Your body is now the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's where the sanctuary resides. That's where the sanctuary is today for the church age believers or for the believers, actually. The sanctuary is here. There is no more sanctuary anywhere. There isn't a sanctuary around the world that has been made with hands of men. Some call things sanctu sanctuary, but by definition, according to Scripture, that, the last one has been leveled. Now each of us are walking temples of the Most High. He lives in you. Why should you, how could you worry about anything when you and I understand that God is indwelling us? We're talking about the third person at this point. We'll see a few other 
where the Father and the Holy and Jesus is also indwelling us. He's indwelling us. Is there power in the Holy Spirit? He uh, raised Jesus from the dead. The Father raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus said he raised himself and destroyed this body and in three days I will raise it up. The Holy Spirit raised Jesus. All three were working together, cooperating together. They don't do anything apart from each other. They're always in sync. And he indwells you in the temple. Can you imagine you and I have been blessed to be able to say that the temple is in me, in you. He chooses now to reside in each believer who says yes to Jesus Christ. What if they're not living a holy life? Well, that comes in time. That comes through constant intake. That comes through discipleship. That comes through brethren coming along together and assisting and empowering each other with sometimes kind words. You fell again? I'm going to help you. What can I do? I'm going to help you again and again and again. Because the truth is, that's why Paul said, we're hands and feet. We're one body. A hand can't say, I don't need the feet. Feet can't say, I don't need the eye. We need every part of our body. Even those things that are hidden are really, really, really important, Paul says. The, the invisible parts of the body, like your liver, your kidney, your lungs. Imagine losing one. We are all connected together, spiritually speaking, because of the Holy Spirit, because of the promise, who offers the threefold convicting ministry, who offers regeneration at the moment of faith, who indwells us, irregardless of our behavior. He disciplines us when we're off track, and He empowers us when we're walking, so that we can be representatives of Him as ambassadors, as soldiers of Christ. He's never left us alone. He's given us all kinds of titles. Some people like to put their title, pastor, so-and-so, doctor, masters, reverend. God has given you and assigned titles to you. He's allowed you to call yourself a Christian, a disciple of His, an ambassador of His, a soldier for Christ. A royal priest. All because of responding to Jesus Christ. And you, you're not the one saying, oh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an ambassador of, of the heaven. I'm an ambassador of Jesus. No. He's telling us what we are. Whether you agree or not, whether you like it or not. He's declaring to everyone who takes in his word that those who are believers... We're ambassadors. And you know how it is. If we represent a foreign country, or if someone represents a foreign country, all eyes are on that person. That one ambassador speaks for the entire country. And yet, we have been assigned, and we have been given the title of as an ambassador of Jesus Christ. So that means that we're declaring to a dying world those without Christ, those who have not placed their faith in Christ. You want to know what it is to believe in Christ? You want to know what it is to know Christ? Look at me. Come talk to me. Come to my house and check out what I do, how I set my mind on the things above. Look at what I do on a given Sunday. Look at what I do in a given week. It may be good, it may be bad. But we have been assigned, we have been called ambassadors, so whether you like it or not, you represent him. And it could be a good thing or not so good. It depends on your volition. Depends on you. Are you going to live up to who he is? Are you going to reflect Christ in everything you say, think, and do? That's, that's an act, that's a decision we all have to make on our own. And then, of course, we covered the baptism. What's the baptism? Identifying. Identifying. Okay, good. That's that part where we're baptized into the body of Christ. And we'll look again. We'll review uh, in just a moment the two types of baptism, a real and ritual. 
Anybody remember the difference between a real baptism and a ritual baptism? Baptism in, in, in water. Right. Proclamation that you are Christian. Good. Baptism in spirit. Very good. Which one's which? The real is the dry one. Okay, that's a good one. The real baptism is the baptism that God himself does. Where he enjoins us as brethren, as parts of the body of Christ. The ritual baptism is when we take a dunk and we're, we are wet, we're saturated with water. We, either you, you know, put it on your head, you go in the ocean, and uh, that's the ritual baptism. So there's two types. And it's important to know that there's a total of eight different baptisms. And I gave you a list last year. Eight. So, but uh, by way of review, yes, the, the baptism, when the Holy Spirit's involved, He's not water baptizing us. He's put, placing us into the family of God. Or at this point, we are now, it's a one-time baptism. We're not constantly being baptized. We have been placed once and for all never to be undone. But the, the other aspects of this promise, this is all coming from the one promise. This acts on, changes it all. We now do not have to live like the Jews without power. We now have the access to God himself and the access is taking place from the inside. Okay, So you've got this water baptism and then the next one, we've talked briefly about this in the past, is the filling. Remember we talked about uh, in Acts 5.18, Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with what? So we should not allow wine to influence us, but we should allow God's Holy Spirit to influence us. Um, back in the 70s, the common way to understand this is don't be controlled with wine, but be controlled with the, the Spirit. And there's been a subtle adjustment with the word filled, and it's now it's pr the preferred way to understand con uh, the filling is rather than saying controlled with the Spirit or by the Spirit, it should be influenced. Because if you think for a moment, if God the Holy Spirit is controlling you, how can you ever break out of his control? You'd have to be more powerful than, him, than God himself. So it, it conveys the same thing, and I think it, it makes better sense to say that we're under the influence, especially when you think of the, the verse here, do not be under the influence with wine, but be under the influence of the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit. And so this is a command, uh, be filled is a passive command, which means letting the Holy Spirit influence us. So we can't influence ourselves. We can't empower ourselves. That's something that's going to be the result of our relationship with the Holy Spirit. By the way, the filling fluctuates, right? The influence fluctuates. Everything else, regeneration is a one-time transaction. Indwelling is a one-time transaction. Um, baptism is a one-time transaction. Filling it fluctuates daily, probably minute by minute. You go in the, in fact, I'll show you in the next slide. You, you go from fellowship out of fellowship, fellowship, fellowship out of fellowship. You're going in and out, in and out because of the decisions we make on a daily basis. So filled is not permanent. It's not a one-time transaction. That's my point. It's something that we are commanded to do and to allow to happen to us. So, uh, in fact, let me just uh, take us to the next slide. We've looked at this before. The white uh, depicts a believer who is in fellowship or harmony with God. The gray circle on the right is the believer who is in sin. Still a believer, but now in sin, because we are called in Christ. Or Paul uses this positional truth. He says, you are in Christ. That's our union. It speaks of our union with him. We are in Christ. 
So it's not that um, uh, we, we're no longer um, having this face-to-face -face relationship with Christ. He resides in us. We're in Christ. He abides in us. We in Him, Him in us. They in us too, by the way. So the believer is in Christ. The believer is in fellowship uh, and harmony with God. Uh, the ideal time to deal with struggles, the believer is what? This is where we are empowered, we're in the white. So as long as, you know, if we've confessed our sins and we've recovered from uh, some sin, we're back in harmony with God, that's all the white circle means. And then if we're in sin, we go in the gray, which basically means that we are out of fellowship and another word for fellowship is just harmony. We don't lose God. He doesn't leave us. We don't lose the indwelling, but we lose his empowerment. We lose his influence. The closest relationship here on earth, the, the, probably the next closest relationship is um, um, between husband and wife because they're now one. And you know how painful it is when you're not seeing eye to eye. And so if you ignore that long enough, then you're just going to go on and on and on as roommates. You're just going to look at each other. You're not going to be able to accomplish much because you're not in talking terms. And so likewise, God will always love you. God will always protect you. There's a general provision that he provides. But he also says, whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. So he'll allow us to make, our own, make a decision. He wants us to come back. He wants us to recover. But if we're stubborn and we want to go AWOL and go the direction of the prodigal son, he'll sometimes allow that to happen so that we can learn on our own that it's better to be with him. Isn't that what the son learned? He learned in his sin that it was better to be in harmony with his father. You know, he was sitting there and he was feeding the, the swine like this. This is ridiculous. I can't believe I'm, I used to have all this money and now I'm, I'm feeding swine. It smells pretty good, but this is for the swine. He didn't have anything for himself. And that's when he said, I had it better with my father. I wonder if my father will accept me as a hired servant. He realized while he was in sin, while he hit rock bottom, that it was better off to be under the care of his father, which is what he left. He chose to leave the father, did he not? He made a volitional act and said, I'm tired of you telling me what to do. I'm old enough now. Give me a part of my, well, give me what rightfully belongs to me as far as the inheritance. Give it to me. The father did not resist. And you know what's interesting is when you look closely at that story, it says in the opening of that story, and several days later, the son left. So he didn't just take the money and go. He took the money and he stayed at home for a few more days. So he was thinking about it, thinking about it, thinking about it, thinking about it, and then he decided, I'm just going to go. I, I, can't, I can't stand it here anymore. And you know the rest of the story. He goes, he splurges, he uses his money on friends, and the brother had this picture. He, he, he said, you know, uh, Dad, you know what your son's been doing? He's been spending it on prostitutes. So adding to the pain, adding, you know, the brother was upset, as you'll recall, because his son is back, and now his father's throwing him this party. So the older brother said, Dad, you, you know what he did? You know what? He, he shamed us. He shamed you. Did the father rebuke the younger son? Not at all. He threw a party. So the believer is out of fellowship here. We're in the gray. He was in the gray, if this is a prodigal son. And then, of course, the objective at this point is to recover the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit, 
which is through 1 John 1 9. Why? Because that tells us point blank how to recover from sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if we exercise 1 John 1 9, that gets us back into harmony. That's his that's the mechanics by which we recover. Otherwise, the only thing left is discipline. And at this point, on the right corner here, we have no power. This is where we're miserable. We're irritable. We're short. We have no power from God himself. He's still indwelling us. He has regenerated us. He has baptized us. But we have no influence anymore because we have severed the harmony with God through sin. And sin can be uh, entered into these three gates here. It could be mental. Remember, if you look at a woman and lust after her, you've committed adultery in your heart. He raised the bar. Remember that? An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth in the old days. Now I tell you, whoever's angry without his brother, without a cause, shall be in danger of judgment. There's all kinds of things in Matthew 5. So there's mental sins, there's overt sins, there's things that could be clearly seen that is wrong. You're stealing something, you're, you're hurting someone. Verbally, even that commit, uh, counts as a sin. We're supposed to speak those things which are edifying and uplifting to the brethren. That's a command. And when we put them down and we say things that go contrary to what he has specified in the scripture, we're warring against what he has said in his word. Okay, looking at the circles again, I always add these together, I, I connect these together. The believer is empowered by God the Holy Spirit, so the believer has the power to deal with issues and future sin. Remember I've said that believer, the believer is living in the sphere of fellowship and sin is impossible during this time. And you find this in 1 John 3, 9. It is impossible to sin when you're in fellowship. But you orient, you take your mind off of him, then when you sin, it's not because of the seed, it's not because of the new man, it's because of the old man. The believer is studying and applying the word of God, again, while in the white. Um, this is what maintains the the uh, harmony and fellowship. The believer who loves Christ will demonstrate this by his actions. John 14, 15 and 21 and there's another one maybe in 23 or 24. If you love me, obey me. If you love me, keep my word. So he wants us to be obedient. He wants us to apply his word, not just believe. We are to believe in Christ for salvation and we have to believe in Christ when he says something. If he says a promise, we ought to believe it. If he, if he says, trust me, or if he says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, then that means to be still. If he says, be anxious for nothing, that means don't worry about anything. Sometimes it's easier said than done, but the way to get to the point where you can trust him is to take in his word on a regular basis. It's all about knowing him. And really, the bottom line is, is he trustworthy? Can I take him at his word? He said, don't worry. Am I, gonna, am I willing to believe him? So remember, this is in phase three, uh, P3, where we will receive gold, silver, or precious stones. You find this in 1 Corinthians 3.12. You actually get rewarded for honoring his word. You actually get awarded for, rewarded for uh, keeping the commands. And uh, someone had asked, well, is it wrong to be motivated by the rewards? No. Jesus opted to motivate us uh, through rewards. Um, it's not a bad thing at all. I mean, if that's what he thought would motivate some of us. I think, I do believe some of us do it just because we love him without wanting to receive anything because we've already received the greatest gift of all, which is everlasting life. But he does tell us that we will be rewarded. And he will say in the end, well done thou good and faithful servant. Right? 
So this is in phase three. You got the three phases of salvation. Phase one is justification. Phase two, sanctification. Phase three, glorification, where we are face to face with God. So that's when we will receive gold, silver, or precious stones. And I take this to mean during the seven year tribulation. Remember, we will be raptured away from the tribulation before it starts. And then during that seven years, I believe the, the rewards will be distributed during that time. When? We, we, nobody really knows. I, there's some ideas, but again, it's not really um, specified um, in, in the scripture. Then on the right, we have the believer who is empowered by the old sin nature. That's also phase three where you will receive wood, hay, and straw. If you, uh, like I was showing earlier, if I was giving a, a cup of coffee to Mark and it was to influence or to show you how good of a Christian I am, then my works will be displayed and it'll burn. And it will turn into wood, hay, or straw. It's not going to remain. But I will be saved as through fire. So my, our wards are going to be our works are the one that's going to be analyzed. Um, even the unbeliever, as you'll recall, uh, when we get judged, it's going to be on the merit of, it's going to be based on our what? Works. Right. Why not sin? It's already been taken care of. Sin has been taken care of. What happened on the cross 2,000 years ago? What did he do on the cross? He died, and then? Hmm? Yes, so the, he has paid the sin debt, right? He has satisfied the bill. It's the propitiation. There's no more sin issue anymore. There's a daily struggle of sin, but as far as that barrier between man and God, that wall has been leveled. That doesn't stand between man and God anymore. What stands between man and God is whether or not they will respond to Jesus Christ and receive the gift of salvation so that they could be adopted into the family of God. And when they're adopted into the family of God, now they can receive the promise, receive the regeneration, threefold convicting ministry of the Spirit, regeneration. What's the next one? Indwelling. Indwelling. What's after that? Baptism. What's after that? Filling, which fluctuates. That promise is key. That will help every person live in a way that will ultimately, ultimately glorify God. So sin is not the barrier anymore. The only time sin is a barrier is when we as family commit sin here and now. It doesn't come and it doesn't destroy our phase one salvation. It doesn't destroy the fact that we've been saved. But it comes in between me and God, and the fellowship is broken. That makes sense? Okay. So in here, if we have any uh, works that have been done under the, empowering uh, the empowerment of the sin nature, God will see that, and he will reward it with wood, hay, and straw. And then when, it, and we, and when his eyes look at it and judges it, it's going to light up. Unlike some of the works here, I believe we're going to have some gold, silver, and precious stones. Freddie, good job. I appreciate what you've done during your lifetime. You did this in January. You did this in February. That, that account, that allows you to receive a, uh, some silver. This one gets precious stone. This one gets gold. This one gets precious stone. Uh-oh. This one here is straw. Oh, this one here is hay. This one here is wood. Oh, this one here is precious stone. So he's going to go through my works and each one that's done with the right motive under the empowering ministry of the Spirit will receive a reward on the left side. But if we're living under our own strength, drawing attention to self, motives are not pure, wooden hand stubble. Can we tell if anyone is operating with the wrong motive? No. Only God knows. He knows what's going on on the inside. 
The believer is rendered powerless. The believer is stinking like the world. HV is human viewpoint. And we're trying to think divine viewpoint, not human viewpoint. The believer could be disciplined via weakness, sickness, and even death. You mean, how, how will God discipline me? Well, in 1 Corinthians 11, we can see that some of the members in the church, the Corinthian church, were experiencing weakness, some were experiencing sickness, and then death. There's a progression. It, it gets more aggressive. God is trying to get their attention. So it starts with weakness, sickness, and then ultimately death. And remember, the word for death for a believer is sleep. When you look in uh, 1 Corinthians 11, it's actually some are weak, some are sick, some have gone to sleep. Because believers don't die in the, in the sense that unbelievers die, spiritually speaking. Um, we go to sleep. And we, we, see, we see God. Now here again, just another way, this is a recent uh, diagram that I kind of put together just hoping it'll drive this point home as far as uh, under the influence of the flesh or the sin nature and the Spirit of God. Notice on the left, we are the new man. Uh, this is where we are born again. We never sin from this side. Uh, the indwelling of the triune God is there. And that's where the seed originates. So if you think about this, it would look like this. That entire circle is the believer. Okay? Inside, there's that waging war on an ongoing basis that we know too well. On the left side is the new man. And on the right side is the old man. That's where the sin nature resides. That's where the tendency to sin originates. Sin originates from the right, or your sin nature. Righteous deeds and works originate from the left, because it's done under his empowerment. If you sin, it's not because of what's on the left, where the seed is. It's on the right, where your sin nature is which is a very real part of you. But we have two parts in us, right? We have the new man and we have the old man. So it's like this. If I, if I do a righteous deed or if I do something under the empowering ministry of the Spirit and it's rewardable, I'm operating from here. God is going to give me gold, silver, precious stones. But if I commit sin at a mental thought, I'm now operating from this side of me, the sin nature side. Okay? So there's that tension going on on the inside all the time. And depending on what you yield to or who you yield to will determine if you're going to get, and it's not the objective, but you're going to get gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and straw. Okay, so now I want us to look, we've got a, a little more time, let's look at the indwelling of the Father, the indwelling of the Father. The Word of God teaches that God the Father indwells your body. You don't hear this too much. We usually hear it's the Holy Spirit, but the Father also indwells the believer. That's been my understanding, and I'm going to use some verses here to try to demonstrate this. Um, the indwelling of God the Father has never occurred in human history, because God is spirit, until the church age, until the promise has occurred. Okay, never until the promise. You're familiar with John 14, 23? Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our 
monen, that singular, with him. Okay? You see in uh, John 14, 2, where he talks about, in my father's house are ma many mansions, and that's the word, Greek word mone, which is more of a, it's in the plural, many homes. But in here, he says, we will come to him and make our home with him. So we keep his word, loves him, and um, my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Then you've got in Ephesians 4, 6, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in who? Okay. Ephesians 4, 6. And we, we don't have the time at the moment to go through and have an in-depth study, but these are just some verses that hint to the indwelling of, this, of the Father himself. We could, I'm sure, um, do a study on this, but I, I wanted to at least, because we're in Acts, show you what all is involved with this promise. Because this is huge, right? If the promise, if the promise occurred 2,000 years ago and it has forever changed how man interacts and corresponds with God, because of God himself, who now, not just the Holy Spirit indwelling us, and creating this temple for the Shekinah glory of Christ. But if, he's, if the Father is also indwelling us, that's huge. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is now resident in you. To me, it's pretty awesome. You have no reason to be discouraged. Only if you put your focus on the things of this world, the circumstances of this world. Ephesians 4, 6. So in all... And through all, and you all. Is this a, a conclusion you arrived at? Yes, yeah. based on um, the verses that we're looking at. Oh yeah, there are quite a few doctrinal teachers that that adhere to this too. This is nothing really new. Oh, well, that's good. I mean, at least you can. Uh, inspect and see if I'm consistent by using the I'm not even quote I'm not I'm not this is not my words these are I'm quoting scripture Steve on that last slide how would you make the difference between that first verse which seems conditional and the second one which does not um, I think the first one is the it characterizes a person who is in good standing with God. If you're loving him. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Yes. And if they're in that status of loving by keeping his word, he comes to make his home, which seems to be, to me, conditional. Yes. And the other one, which seems to be a promise. I'm just saying yes. in general, how would you reconcile the two? That's, that's all. I think um, with the second one, it's a statement of fact. The first one is to encourage and to even challenge the disciples to love and keep his word. So that if, for example, if I'm over here, or is it over here? If I'm here living in sin, then it would not look like the Father and Jesus is indwelling me because of my sinful actions. So it would be fair to say it just like if you and me were in the same room, just mm -hmm. like the Father comes to his us. And that would be like the bottom one, Ephesians Correct. 4, 6. And for us to have fellowship, we being in the same room, that relates to our experiential relationship That's right. with each other. That's right. Sanctification. So they, they do complement each other. That yeah. One relates to fellowship. Correct. One relates to the principle of him living in us so that we can have fellowship. That's right. So, yeah, I think, I think this is, uh, like you said, I think this is just a statement of fact that it's he is in all the believers, but in the first part, it kind of reminds me of 1 John. When we are not loving the brethren, then we're abiding in death. God is not abiding in us type of thing. So when I'm living sinfully, that's not a reflection of John 14, 23, is it? Does that kind of remind you that God is living in me when I'm doing all this 
crime. So I think both are true. First one is talking about our justification. The top, I mean, the second one is talking about our ju uh, justification. Second one, the, the top one is talking about our sanctification, where we are conditioned, we are commanded. We, the condition is, if you love me, keep my word, my Father and I will abide in you, remain in you. So he's challenging them here to keep this relationship that are, or to keep consistent with the words that are being uh, mentioned through Jesus Christ. Sanctification, top one. Justification, bottom one. Okay? So no, no contradiction at all. Mark? What if we're like, greeting the Spirit or yes. quenching the Spirit? How, is that the same thing happening with yeah. the Father and the Son? I believe it's, it would be the same. Right. It wouldn't make sense that one would be grieved and the other one wouldn't. Right. But you retain the indwelling, but our behavior is no longer characteristic of one who's in compliance with loving God or keeping his word. See? Yeah. Okay. One more, and then we're done. Let's stop here. Um, Philippians 2.13 for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Philippians 2.13. Now let me just add one more since we're already here. So for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So there you see that God is working in you to the Philippians, the believers. And 1 John 4.15, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God... God abides in him and he in God. So we will look at this some more next week. This is where we will resume. We'll park here for now and uh, look at this for next week. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, as always, we are thankful for the fact that we can assemble together to know you more through your word. Thank you for the freedom that we have because of your love for each and every one of us and even for the military that are working on your behalf. We can certainly assemble together here in America so that we can uh, strengthen our relationship with you while we impact others for the cause of Christ. And uh, we think of those around the world that are suffering as a result of their faith in you. We are hearing more and more stories of Christians who are suffering and even dying because of their faith. And I just pray in a, a very special way, dear God, that you would intervene and somehow just uh, turn the tide and allow uh, military and whatever else uh, that you think would be useful to, to allow these Christians to just be able to learn more about your word while they promote your son, Jesus Christ. Um, I pray, Father, for all of us here that we would be challenged by some of these Christians around the world who are having to face real difficulties, unlike us here, where we, we can share Christ, and the only difficulty we would have is just whether or not we are ready or whether or not we're willing, um, whether it's convenient or not. So I pray, Father, that we would be challenged by this and that we would uh, make it a point to uh, look for those opportunities that you provide for us, that we would be sensitive to these things, so that ultimately you would be glorified. Thank you, Father, for this time. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.